This film documents the Vietnam War. Many scenes are graphic in nature, and viewer discretion is advised. Good evening. The television and radio stations of the United States and their affiliated stations are proud to provide facilities for a discussion of issues in the current political campaign by the two major candidates for the presidency. The candidates need no introduction. The Republican candidate, Vice President Richard M. Nixon, and the Democratic candidate, Senator John F. Kennedy. According to rules set by the candidates themselves, each man shall make an opening statement of approximately eight minutes duration and a closing statement of approximately three minutes. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear that you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of your ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. Office of President of the United States. Office of President of the United States. 
Play Coup, 250 miles north of Saigon, the airbase that was ripped by Vietnamese communist guerrillas. 
eight Americans died in the attack that brought swift retaliation by U.S. and South Vietnamese forces. From carriers and land bases, 49 jets struck back at staging areas just across the border in North Vietnam. The Red Guerrillas were able to slip by Vietnamese guards in the middle of the night raid and lob mortar shells into the area while hand-carried bombs were placed under aircraft and against barrack walls. Why security was so lax is the object of two investigations. Although some officers say full protection against such attacks is impossible in this jungle war. on patrol made contact with the elusive enemy when the Viet Cong struck in a variation of his favorite tactic, a surprise attack from the shadows. But the VC, already aware he has little chance of winning a stand-up fight, it is through skillful use of patrols of many different sizes and types that our military commanders in Vietnam maintain contact with the enemy and exert the constant pressure which is weakening the VC's grip on areas he has controlled for years by tyranny and terror. For every patrol, of course, the way is strung with danger. And only constant vigilance can turn up the vicious array of often primitive but surprisingly effective booby traps and obstacles with which the crafty enemy has pocked the green earth. Even a youngster plodding along the road could have a grenade concealed in the heavy burden. It has happened before. The patrol must wait until the road itself is swept with mine detectors. When it moves on, it finds the spider holes in which snipers have been or may still be hiding. The patrol search turns up punji pits filled with needle-sharp bamboo sticks. And sprouting everywhere are the bamboo spears the Marines call Victor Charlie toothpicks, sharp enough to pierce a boot, often smeared with crude poison. Handmade explosives are set to detonate at the slightest tug on a tripwire. In the tree lines and along the bank of the nearby stream, 
The patrol uncovers a complicated network of trenches and tunnels. After a careful probing, Marine combat engineers are called forward to destroy the enemy fortification. Colonel Dickey's patrol in force has accomplished its mission, search and destroy. The Viet Cong simultaneously attacked just about every major city and town in South Vietnam. In one day, they increased the scope of the war dramatically. Howard Tuckner was there. The war came to Saigon early in the morning of January 31st. The first target was the symbol of the American presence in Vietnam, the United States Embassy. About 20 Viet Cong had invaded the embassy compound and were now battling American Marines and military police. The Viet Cong had penetrated to the center of what was supposed to be the most secure city in Vietnam. On the fifth day of the battle for Hue, the Marines moved out from the fortified army compound that had stood the original attack. What's the hardest part of it? Not knowing where they are, that's the worst thing. Riding around the running the sewers and the gutters anywhere. Be anywhere. Just hope you can stay alive day to day. Everybody just wants to go back home and go to school. That's about it. You lost any friends? Quite a few. We lost one the other day. 
cold like a stink. This is where the Viet Cong raiders broke in. They'd sneaked up and blasted a hole in the reinforced concrete fence surrounding the compound. They had the big embassy wall to protect them. They were inside before anyone knew it. But none of the raiders lived to tell of their exploit. By 8 o'clock, five hours after they first broke in, almost all of them were dead. All in civilian clothes, they'd been armed with American M-16 rifles and also rocket launchers and rockets. They had explosives, their purpose apparently to destroy the embassy. A villa on the embassy grounds was the residence of the mission coordinator, George Jacobson. He was trapped there on the second floor. Later, when it was all over, Jacobson told what had happened. What could you see from your window? Were the, were the VC in the buildings? No, I did not see any VC in the building, except that I knew that there was at least one VC in my house. Uh, I knew that he was um, on the bottom floor of my house. Well, they put riot gas into the bottom floors of my house, which, of course, would drive whoever was down uh, below up top where I was. Uh, they had thrown me a pistol uh, about 10 minutes before this occurred. And uh, uh, with all the luck that I've had uh, all of my life, uh, I got him before he got me. With the I'm pistol, sorry. and he had what? An M16. And you got him. That seems to be the 1968 election. And he is beaming, Pat Nixon is beaming. One can't help but think back to 1960 mm -hmm. when... Uh... President Nixon is about to address the nation on the status of the peace negotiations on Vietnam have concluded an agreement to end the war and bring peace with honor in Vietnam and in Southeast Asia. Within 60 days from this Saturday, all Americans held prisoners of war throughout Indochina will be released. There will be the fullest possible accounting for all of those who are missing in action. During the same 60-day period, all American forces will be withdrawn from South Vietnam. We must recognize Ending the war is only the first step toward building the peace.
Something happening here But what it is ain't exactly clear There's a man with a gun over there Telling me I got to beware I think it's time we stop Children, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down Being wrong Nobody's right If everybody's wrong Young people speak in their minds Are getting so much resistance From behind the Time we stop Hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down A field day for the heat A thousand people in the street Singing songs and they're carrying signs Mostly say hooray for our side It's time we stop, hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down Your life it will creep It starts when you're always afraid Step out of line The man come and take you away, away. We better stop Hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going We better stop Hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going We better stop Now, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going We better stop Thousands of demonstrators opposed to the Vietnam War assembled in the nation's capital for a mass protest. For the most part orderly, minor scuffles did occur between the demonstrators and hecklers. A three-hour parade takes the demonstrators across the Potomac on their way to the Pentagon. The crowd estimated at about 50,000 persons was a loose confederation of some 150 groups and included adults, students, even children. It is at the Pentagon where the first test of strength comes. Military police contain the crowd, but clashes soon break out. Federal marshals arrest several who attempt to break through the protective line. Reinforcing the marshals, a second wave of MPs with fixed bayonets in scabbards move into position. Some 400 demonstrators are arrested, two soldiers are injured, and tear gas is used. Six break into a Pentagon side door, but are quickly apprehended in the day-long disturbance.
Tuesday, April 29th. The streets of Saigon, usually jammed with traffic at the morning rush hour, are quiet. The attack by communist aircraft at Saigon's Tansunut Airport the day before has prompted a 24-hour curfew. And the only people on the streets are ambulance drivers and policemen. With communist forces only a few miles from the center of Saigon, the order to evacuate American nationals is given. Americans and citizens of third countries who have been guaranteed space on the airlift gather at assembly points for the bus ride to Tansunut Airport. But the buses have to be abandoned when helicopters at Tansunut come under fire from both communist and South Vietnamese troops. Heavy shelling at the airport destroys planes on the ground. The American ambassador, Graham Martin, took personal control of the evacuation. Marines use smoke to signal helicopters they should land on the lawn behind the embassy walls, where they would be protected from ground fire. Those South Vietnamese not lucky enough to have been chosen for evacuation defied the curfew and stood outside the embassy gate, begging for a seat on the helicopters. Many of these people have relatives in Canada. Some carried visas issued by the Canadian embassy in Saigon. But for most, it wasn't enough to get them a ride out. South Vietnamese army pilots flew their families to safety aboard the carriers as well. But because there wasn't room to store their helicopters, as well as those flown by American pilots, the Vietnamese were forced to ditch their aircraft at sea. The pilots were picked up by American Navy rescue boats. Yeah. 
flowers gone, gone to flowers, everyone. When will they ever learn?